Today I'm going to talk about a book that is very difficult to value, uh, and what better example of a complicated book than one that belonged to an extremely complicated woman. Uh, the two slender volumes in this attractive little red Morocco case belong to Madame de Pompadour, the chief mistress of Louis XV, the King of France, from uh, 1745 to 1751. Uh, now, in her day, uh, many of her contemporaries derided her uh, because of what they uh, viewed as um, political malevolence. And certainly, under her sphere of influence, France suffered its fair number of defeats, whether it was the uh, loss of the French colonies in Canada to the English, or the uh, fatal alliance with Austria, uh, or indeed some embarrassing naval defeats. Uh, but that was not the only reason her contemporaries were suspicious of her. She really upset uh, the social hierarchies of her day. Uh, she was not a woman born into aristocracy, but within a few years she was in the inner chambers of the king. She had the king's ear on important political matters. So you could understand the great amount of political intrigue and gossip uh, about her. Now, I like to uh, view a uh, person's reputation optimistically, like uh, Taylor Swift, uh, and I should uh, think of the glass as half full, or uh, I guess in her case, the Sevres porcelain teacup is being half full. Uh, and I say that because she was extraordinarily important uh, in the 18th century decorative arts, whether it was Chinese and Japanese sculpture, uh, or the glasswork of Venice, or even, you know, those decorative uh, porcelain teacups and other porcelains that were manufactured in the Sev uh, factories uh, during the period. Uh, from our perspective, and luckily for us, she also had a particular affection for bookbinding. Um, many of the finest uh, French bookbinders of the period, um, like Antoine de Padeloup, the binder for the King of France, made books to order for her. Uh, and this was really the apogee uh, of 18th century French bookbinding art. Uh, later on, uh, Leon Gruel, a well-known uh, bookbinder in his own right and a bookbinding historian, held within his hands a magnificent Padeloup volume of a blotter writing a book that had been bound for Madame de Pompadour, and he wondered what under those gloriously ornate gilded covers, uh, what secrets it held that she had written in it, uh, a sort of uh, uh, plotting in the blotting, uh, so to speak. Uh, Madame de Pompadour had a magnificent library of uh, 3,525 uh, books, making it one of the finest libraries ever assembled by a woman in the 18th century. Uh, she was not uh, alone as a woman collector. In fact, the uh, tradition uh, really uh, probably went back to Diane de Poitiers, or Diane Poitiers, the mistress of uh, Henry uh, II, uh, who collected a very fine library in her own right. Uh, Interestingly, she uh, collected them almost as remainder books because Francois I uh, had decreed uh, that a copy of every book would be given to the state to build up the National Library, uh, and she was able to add on to that uh, that a second copy would be given to her for her shelves. Uh, but uh, I uh, certainly uh, uh, like the library of Madame de Pompadour. In fact, it is an extremely extensive library and it covers the full gamut of subjects, whether it's history, uh, philosophy, uh, li literature, and uh, especially her love of French theater. Uh, I also like it because it is not a uh, library of uh, affectation. It was a library assembled with purpose, uh, with love, uh, and to her taste, exactly. And we are extraordinarily fortunate as well to have the catalog of the library, which is always exciting for booksellers. Uh, in 1765, the books were auctioned, and a catalog, uh, which I have on the computer here, 
uh, was produced, uh, which is a, available even now in its entirety through uh, Google Books. So a big uh, dance there for Google Books for having that available. Uh, and this particular volume is number 624 in that catalog. Uh, so uh, all this chit chat about, oops, all this chit chat about Madame de Pompadour, and I have not even opened uh, the volumes yet. And uh, thank you so much for watching. And no, no, it's not the end of the video. I'm just joking. I'm going to open uh, the box. Um, the first thing we notice when we open it is the uh, uh, escutcheon or the armorial of uh, the uh, Madame de Pompadour, which is immediately obvious because it contains three castles. Uh, that's quite interesting because, as I said, she was not a woman that came from aristocracy and in 1745, uh, before her presentation uh, to the court and the king, uh, he had to grant to her uh, arms and land and title, including uh, those uh, three castles which are emblazoned uh, within her arms. So what is the book? Uh, the book itself is uh, the Le Roman de la Rose, uh, The Romance of the Rose uh, by Guillaume Loris. Uh, this copy is printed in 1538 and has some uh, very interesting woodcuts uh, throughout it, as well as some handwritten annotations, uh, which we will get to. Uh, the Romance of the Rose uh, is perhaps the single most famous uh, um, medieval French poem of the 14th century. Uh, it basically uh, has to do with a courtier uh, getting his love, but also explores uh, the philosophy, uh, the reason and nature of love itself. Uh, so you could understand why a book like that would be extraordinarily appealing to Madame de Pompadour, giving her the path through her life, uh, as well as her station as being uh, the uh, chief mistress. Uh, of the king. It's actually quite an extraordinary book because uh, it's filled with sensual lyrics and you can imagine uh, during this time how strict the church was that they would not tolerate even the slightest deviation from religious dogma and how they let this book, which was frequently printed and read by the aristocracy, uh, be read so widely is quite a mystery. Uh, in fact, it was uh, so closely read by the aristocracy that uh, bibliographers and historians have even termed it the breviary or like a religious work of the aristocracy. Uh, that's how frequently it was found uh, in libraries uh, there. So as I said, uh, this is a work that certainly would appeal to Madame de Pompadour. And sure enough, if we check the catalog here, we find not one copy of the work, but indeed uh, three copies of the work in her library. And uh, the first one here, and I'm just going to pull that up, is uh, a magnificent uh, copy on vellum uh, with miniatures. I can't even imagine what that is worth today. Uh, the second one was a folio copy. Uh, and the third one is the more modest copy here we have from uh, 1538 uh, with uh, manuscript interpretive notes it's recorded in the catalog itself. Uh, now that is extremely interesting. Uh, uh, as I said, this particular copy has uh, manuscript notes throughout many of the margins in the book. Uh, Booksellers today, librarians, as soon as we see annotations in the margins, we get very excited because it gives us an indication of how these books were read during the period. Uh, it's quite extraordinary that an 18th century catalog would even mention the notes because uh, that was not popular in the period. And actually, if someone took a pen to the margins of a book, you might even consider that defacement. Uh, but they made special attention to the notes. In fact, it's the only book that I see in the entire catalog where such manuscript notes are mentioned. So it begs the question immediately of who wrote these notes? And the first question that comes to mind is, were they in the hand of Madame de Pompadour herself? Because that would be extraordinary. This is a book I said would 
definitely appeal to her. And I imagine like that painting of Francois Boucher where she's reclining with a quill pen nearby that she would be jotting down her thoughts as she read through the book several times. Uh, now, how do we go about determining if that is her handwriting? Uh, well, there's certainly plenty of examples of her handwriting uh, online and we can make close comparison. We want to pick a a hand that is not particularly formal, but that was used more casually for, as you would imagine, annotations or a quick note would be. Uh, we also have to be a little bit careful of uh, what I would consider confirmation bias, which is, of course, talked about in political circles today, but definitely is important in the autograph world, because when you're looking to confirm handwriting of somebody you suspect uh, is famous or important, uh, and you compare the slants of letters and the shapes of letters, you don't want to just choose the data points that confirm your belief that you found a treasure. Um, in fact, I tend to do the opposite extreme, even when I find convincing, if not irrefutable evidence, uh, I tend uh, not to have great faith in it. It's like that uh, song, I'm a believer. Well, I'm a uh, disbeliever, uh, I guess. Um, when I do that, however, I do find very, very close similarity between the notes in this book. Uh, they certainly are an 18th century hand and uh, the writing of Madame de Pompadour. I can show one example here uh, where if we look at, for instance, uh, the E in uh, she writes the notes of machines de guerre, machines of war, uh, and we compare that uh, to a, another E in a Note, she definitely wrote in 1763. You can see that they are almost identical. Uh, now, of course, I can't go over all of the notes in the book in a short video, but I'm quite confident that this is in the hand of Madame de Pompadour, which makes it uh, rather extraordinary in my opinion. Uh, I think that is also supported by the fact that these notes were recorded in the catalog itself in 1765 as interesting. Uh, so it's hard to imagine that somebody would have done that during that period unless they thought uh, that they were indeed important. So how does one go about uh, valuing a complicated volume like this? Uh, well, we can search, uh, for instance, for other copies of uh, the Romance of the Rose um, as, one, as one part of it. Uh, the edition from 1538 was actually one of the last editions, I think the last edition of the 16th century. Uh, and it's not an extremely rare or valuable volume in and of itself, $1,500, $2,000, something on that order. Uh, but of course, there is the provenance of Madame de Pompadour. Now, there are many books from her library that come up to auction, and, uh, and we can look at many here if I look through some of the auction records. Uh, they really have such a broad range of prices. Uh, this one at two, in 2020 was just offered um, for it's almost unbelievable that this did not sell for four volumes with her coats of arms for only 300 euros. It did not sell. I, I don't know how I missed that one. I would have bought it. Um, and then you find on the other extreme, you know, important volume selling in Paris auctions for 60 or 70,000 uh, euros. I would probably uh, put this uh, volume somewhere in between. Now, when I got the volume, I didn't even uh, have this particular conundrum because I actually bought it uh, for a library, but because of the circumstances currently uh, and budgets in flux during this pandemic, uh, they ended up not taking it and I got to study it uh, for a longer period. So I think a reasonable price for an extraordinarily, extraordinarily interesting set like this might be about $18,000. Now, of course, uh, that is like a pulling a feather uh, from, the, uh, from an 18th century berger woman's hat. Uh, and I might be overpricing it. Uh, and uh, I also might be underpricing it if it is indeed an extraordinarily important work uh, for scholarship, uh, for studying her life and her innermost thoughts. Uh, so uh, only time will tell whether that is a fair price, whether it actually sells or not. 
Uh, and uh, those are some of the difficulties of being a bookseller and pricing interesting, unique uh, books. Uh, so, and as well, some of my reasoning behind it. Uh, so I hope you uh, like this little episode uh, and will subscribe for future discussions and talks about rare books in the antiquarian book business.